Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Kurt Wohler here uh, from Integrative Medicine Academy. This is the monthly installment, a complimentary webinar for Great Plains Lab. So we want to, you know, uh, thank Great Plains for putting these, you know, seminars on now, really, actually, for many, many years. So we're putting together a good library of stuff. So I thought what I would do uh, this month is come back <clears throat> and talk about small intestine bacterial overgrowth. I've talked about this before. Um, I'm going to take a little bit different angle here. We're going to talk about some essential laboratory tests. I'm going to talk about uh, what I'm currently doing now in practice with incorporating um, some additional testing for SIBO or people who are suspected of having SIBO. This is a condition that a lot of people have. Uh, some people don't know it. Uh, it can be uh, a little bit confused or cross over a bit with regards to irritable bowel syndrome. So uh, it's not always an easy uh, problem to treat. Uh, so some people can be quite complicated. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Dr. Wohler. I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician now for over 20 years. I do some lab advising for biohealth laboratory. I'm a clinical educator for Great Plains Laboratory. I actually have been doing these webinars for Great Plains now for many years. I actually teach their one-day intensive organic acid test seminar, which have been going on now for over three years. So I do a lot of public speaking. I'm an author, educator, as well as a practicing clinician. And I've been working with uh, kids with autism for many years, but I also work with patients with autoimmune, digestive system problems, and neurological disorders. About two and a half, three years ago, I launched something called Integrative Medicine Academy, which is an online uh, academy with different courses for healthcare practitioners. One of them actually is on SIBO, so I'll talk about that a little bit shortly. Any of, any of you who want some additional information, uh, this is a book that my partner, Dr. Trenkatel, and I wrote called Uncovering the Facts <clears throat> About SIBO. So you can text to SIBO to 66866. So text SIBO to 66866 and you'll get a you'll get a link to this book. So before we can talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we need to talk a little bit about irritable bowel syndrome because there's actually a bit of a crossover. Now, irritable bowel or IBS presents often with abdominal bloating, gas, cramps, often worse with eating, many times improved with bowel movements. Now, sometimes in SIBO, you don't always get an improvement with bowel movements, but in irritable bowel, you do. People can have diarrhea, they can have constipation, or they can have mixed patterns where they have constipation alternating with diarrhea. There's commonly a change in stool appearance. So liquid inconsistency, there could be mucus, it could be pellets, it could be stringy sometimes undigested food, and then digestive symptoms that are often uh, occur after, let's say, food poisoning, for example, or you get a gastroenteritis, um, uh, you know, traveler's diarrhea, something like that. And when, you, when it comes to your irritable bowel, these symptoms are also associated with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So the way that we can differentiate many times is through testing. <clears throat> Now, SIBO is a condition where we get increased numbers of normal intestinal bacteria, that is normal colonic bacteria in most regards, sometimes just an overgrowth of sometimes normal in, uh, small intestine bacteria, but the vast majority of our intestinal bacteria are in our large intestine, but they somehow find their way into the small intestine and they overpopulate and cause problems. Now, as I mentioned, SIBO can be associated with irritable bowel. And they figure approximately 45 million people here in the United States suffer with irritable bowel, and upwards of about 30 million go undiagnosed. Approximately 80% of irritable bowel, uh, people with irritable bowel have SIBO. Uh, and irritable bowel is actually the most prevalent GI disorder in the world. Uh, and this information actually comes from a, a lab I'm going to talk about here called Commonwealth Laboratory. Uh, they have a specific test now that <clears throat> is called IBS Check. It's very interesting in how it analyzes for 
autoimmune reactions that can be linked to some type of underlying infectious trigger. Now, because of the compartmentalization of the digestive system, particularly with from the small intestine to the large intestine, it's known that they actually contain some unique bacteria. But when we're looking at SIBO in general, <clears throat> we've got to look at the small intestine and some of the areas that get involved. So the area close to the pancreas is called the duodenum. This is the area that is, is closest to the stomach as food is coming from the stomach, dumps into the duodenum. It's also the area close to our pancreas. So sometimes people will develop bacterial overgrowth in the duodenum that can lead to epigastric pain, reflux, and many times compromised pancreatic function. The jejunum is the largest area of the small intestine. This is where we're absorbing most of our nutrients. And then the ileum is that last part of the small intestine closest to the appendix, but this is also where what's called the ileocecal valve is. And this is an area that is of the major seat of immunity. So things that are compromising the function of the ileum will oftentimes compromise immune function within the digestive system. Now, when it comes to SIBO, there can be many different causes. So in some people that can occur after surgery, so they've had some type of intestinal surgery, something that's disrupted the ileocecal valve, for example. Sometimes motility disorder, so uh, diabetics, for example, or something triggered by celiac disease. Elderly individuals are highly susceptible to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then just the recurrent use of antibiotics and acid blocking medication is also a common cause. So proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec are very commonly used because you can get these not only as a prescription, but also over the counter. So people have access to these as an acid blocking medication for reflux. And so digestion plays a big role, I should say digestive imbalances play a big role in the development of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then as I mentioned before, anything that may disrupt the function of the ileocecal valve could be problematic. Because what ends up happening is if the ileocecal valve is not functioning properly, you can get bacteria from the large intestine that tends to back flush into the small intestine. And so that valve needs to be closed so inflammation that may be occurring around the ileocecal valve can leave it open, something that's caused injury in that area. Uh, and one other interesting thing is for some people who are chronically constipated, straining on the toilet can put back pressure on the ileocecal valve and sort of push colonic bacteria back into the small intestine. Now there can be infectious triggers for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as well as irritable bowel syndrome too. Viruses, so a viral gastroenteritis that causes inflammation in the ileum could disrupt the ileocecal valve. Giardia is a very contagious parasite that is known to really cause disruption throughout the digestive system. In fact, what giardia does is it actually inhibits fat digestion can cause blunting of the brush, brush border cells within the small intestine that compromises digestion and absorption. And all of that can leave, either be leave substrate bacteria that's in the small intestine to proliferate and produce different types of gases, or it can cause damage directly to the ileocecal valve. And then other types of bacteria, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella are often associated with the development of SIBO. And these things can also be related to the development of irritable bowel syndrome as well. <clears throat> a particular type of toxin is called cytolethal distending toxin. This is a toxin that's produced by different types of bacteria. And it, what it does is it damages a specific type of cell called the interstitial cells of the Kajal. And the interstitial cells of Kajal mediate the enteric nervous system. That is the nervous system within the digestive system that regulates smooth muscle contraction. So it has an effect on peristaltic activity and something called migrating motor complex activity. 
Now I mentioned before Commonwealth Diagnostics International or Commonwealth Labs has a specific test called the IBS check. This was actually developed under the guidance of Dr. Uh, Dr. Pimental, who is a gastroenterologist who has done a number of studies over the years and has a tremendous amount of experience in irritable bowel as well as SIBO. And what this IBS check test does is it evaluates for anti-cytolethal distending toxin in something called vinculin. And what happens is, is that vinculin is a normal component of our digestive system. And when, the pr when there's a presence of this cytolethal distending toxin, the immune system gets triggered, creates an autoantibody reaction that then also affects the vinculin and that re reactive complex creates a problem within the migrating motor complex. So it's a basically an infectious trigger where we get the infection that's triggering a toxin and then our immune system tries to deal with the toxin and that reaction causes a cross reaction to vinculin, which then damages the migrating motor complex. And not everybody with SIBO or everybody with irritable bowel has that problem, okay? Because you could develop SIBO, for example, from long-term use of proton pump inhibitors. So it's not always an infectious trigger, but it needs to be on your differential, the list of things to consider. Now, the migrating motor complex is also called this migrating myoelectric complex. Basically, it's this wave formation that occurs in a regular fashion that helps to move debris through the digestive system, whether that's food stuff, um, whether that's bacteria or yeast or other things that find their way into the digestive system. It helps to move it through the small intestine and get these things dumping into the large intestine so they can be eliminated in our stool. But individuals with SIBO often have lower amounts of migrating motor complex activity. Most of us have anywhere between eight to 12, uh, what are called MMC waves that occur naturally over a 24 hour period of time. But people with SIBO sometimes could have two or three. And so basically it means that things have a greater chance of getting stuck in the small intestine. And when we get bacteria that is now proliferating in the small intestine, that's where we really can start to have problems because these bacteria start to ferment different types of carbohydrates. So they can, bacteria, they can produce hydrogen, they can produce methane, and many of them can also produce hydrogen sulfide as well. It gives that rotten egg smell to, to bowel gas. Many people with SIBO as well as irritable bowel can be constipated, and this is often felt to be linked um, more towards methane production. Diarrhea or loose stools is linked more towards high levels of hydrogen. When you have both going on, the symptom picture can be a bit mixed. This is where you get the alternating constipation and diarrhea. But most people with SIBO, just like most people with irritable bowel, will have bloating and cramping and pain and a lot of flatulence, altered bowel movements, and, and many times maldigestion. But with SIBO, you tend to get more problems with absorption because the, uh, the adverse effect is occurring in the small intestine where we're actually absorbing our food. <clears throat> Some other problems linked to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I mentioned before, if you're getting bacterial accumulation up higher in the small intestine, up in the duodenum, it that can cause back pressure on the stomach and that may cause gastroesophageal reflux disease. That may also stimulate nausea or just indigestion. And also in SIBO, we can see vitamin and other nutrient deficiencies. We may have a deficiency in fat-soluble vitamins, for example, because of absorptive problems, or B12 may be low, or even iron. And a lot of times people with SIBO will have systemic complaints, joint pain, headaches, skin problems, fatigue, Acne, rosacea, for example, have often been linked to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The hydrogen gas is a normal 
phenomena. It's a normal gas that is produced in the digestive system to a small degree, but most of it's produced normally in the large intestine. And it makes sense because that's where normally the vast majority of our intestinal bacteria are. But if you're getting hydrogen accumulation in the small intestine, that is abnormal and that becomes a problem because it can have a damaging effect as well as just alter the overall normal function of the small intestine. Methane production is brought about because of the presence of a specific type of bacteria called Methanobrevibacter smithii. And some people will carry a large amounts of this in the digestive system and that's what's causing the methane to be high. When you do hydrogen and methane testing, more people just by numbers seem to have elevated hydrogen than they do methane. But every once in a while, you'll have somebody who has high levels of that particular bacteria where their methane is high. Now, this is a lab test that comes from a lab company called BioHealth Laboratory, and they produce they uh, produce something called the 900C. There are other lab companies that provide the SIBO testing as well, specifically using the lactulose. Lactulose has been kind of the go-to substrate for the detection or the diagnosis of SIBO from a laboratory standpoint. And what we're looking for when we're looking at this kind of test is do we have elevated levels of hydrogen, okay, as is represented here with the blue line, and do we have elevated levels of methane? In this particular person, they've got very high levels of hydrogen and just kind of slightly high levels of methane. If we were to take a guess as to what, what's the prevailing symptom here as far as comparing diarrhea to constipation, they're probably more likely having diarrhea because the methane is so much higher. But that could also be, some, this could be somebody who has a mixed pattern too. The methane could be contributing to some constipation, the hydrogen contributing to diarrhea loose stool. So there may be a little bit of a mix pattern happening here. So this is an individual as a 45 year old female who had a long standing history of constipation, but periodic loose stools that would tend to occur about every seven to 10 days. That would, you know, and that would usually occur for about 24 to 48 hours. Never felt like they completely emptied their bowel. Constant pressure in lower abdomen. So bloating, flatulent, that tends to get worse throughout the day. But at first glance, you think, well, maybe this is an irritable bowel kind of situation. <clears throat> History of esophageal reflux, okay? Particularly worse in the middle of the night. A lot of epigastric dis discomfort that tends to get better with eating. No proton pump inhibitor use, okay? So the person's not on some kind of acid blocking medication. So we could rule that out as a cause. But overall, their gut, they feel worse when they eat heavy meats, raw vegetables and carbs. And so they've limited a lot of their dietary preferences to fish, some rice and vegetables because of so many digestive issues. But when you look at this, you think, okay, what, what could be causing some of these issues here? Is this purely a SIBO case or there might be something else going on? Well, there's a lot of reasons that constipation could occur. It could be occurring because of lack of fiber or dehydration or other infections. The periodic loose stools has a characteristic of a parasitic infection. In fact, Giardia and Cryptosporidium are two common parasites that could give that exact pattern particularly the cryptosporidium. The esophageal reflux, I mean, a lot of people can have that. That could be occurring because of back pressure, for example, within the small intestine from gas formation. But there may also be a helicobacter pylori infection, for example. Epigastric discomfort that gets better with eating is often linked to some type of irritation in the stomach or the possibility of an ulcer. So we can't assume that it's just SIBO or entirely SIBO. No medications or surgical history. Onset of the digestive problems go way back. So they, the digestive problems 
such as constipation, cramping, actually started in this person's mid 20s. So it's probably you know been going on here for about 20 years. Uh, pretty much started in college. Tends to get worse with anxiety and stress, which is very common with people with chronic digestive issues. Now, when her gut feels better, she feels less anxious overall. And there is a communication network between the digestive system and the brain. We often see that because um, many times people who a lot of times become less stressed will sometimes have less digestive problems and vice versa. And that could be either mediated through nerve signaling, such as you know, through the vagus nerve, for example, or perhaps toxins that may be affecting neurochemicals in the brain. Now, the constipation has been progressive over years. This isn't something that just kicked in the last couple of years, the last couple of months. But this person is dependent on over-the-counter laxatives like Miralax to have a bowel movement. So a SIBO test was done, and it shows elevated methane. Okay, That definitely fits with the long-standing history of constipation. It was interesting because the hydrogen levels are normal, but this is a person who had periodic loose stools that would come up about every seven to 10 days. So maybe there's something else happening here, but clearly there is a methane dominant SIBO presentation. Now there's a lot of ways of treating this, um, but what the point I wanna get across is what's absolutely necessary for people with SIBO and even irritable bowel is that a comprehensive approach is taken. It's not just about throwing antibiotics at them or taking you know, a broad spectrum anti uh, antimicrobial botanical. Dietary intervention is key, looking really to reduce carbohydrates um, so that it has a, a killing effect or it helps to you know, take away some of the fuel for the fire, so to speak, with regards to bacteria in the small intestine. Digestive support is often beneficial, whether that's through the use of just regular enzymes along with hydrochloric acid or hydrochloric acid itself. Botanicals are certainly you know, appropriate as well as antibiotics in some cases. What's also critically important is to make sure we have good bowel movement within the large intestine, as well as function of the liver and gallbladder. And these are often missing components, particularly in people who are constipated. Because if all you do is go in and start using an antibiotic, for example, like rifaximine, or you start using different botanicals to kill off the bacteria in the small intestine, but you've not addressed the person's constipation and worked also on liver gallbladder function, many times these people feel worse because you're basically dumping all of those bowel toxins from the small intestine into the large intestine, and then it has nowhere to go. And so people get very reactive, they get much more bloated, much more cramping, but they all can also start to have systemic reactions to headaches, fatigue, brain fog. Most people don't feel too well. Okay, but if you're successful, even in a short period of time, with, with most people with, with SIBO, you're looking probably anywhere you know, between 45 to 90 days, depending on how long they've been dealing with the problem, um, you can get good res resolution. Some people may need longer than that. But one of the problems with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is the recurrence rate. Okay, it can tend to come back. And there can be many factors that can you know, cause this because there's many factors that can contribute to the problem of SIBO. And oftentimes practitioners and patients themselves um, aren't expanding their horizons. They're not doing enough diagnostic testing or patients perhaps are not asking you know, enough questions of what else may be happening here. And so a lot of times people are basically focusing on just reducing bacterial levels in the small intestine without taking a broader view. So SIBO really requires a very comprehensive approach to get some resolution. You can improve some of these symptoms pretty quickly, either with a botanical or an antibiotic. 
but usually the effects aren't long lasting. Because in reality, SIBO is not so much the cause, it's actually a symptom of something else or multiple things that may be going on. And the other thing to keep in mind too, is that the person's presentation of all of these problems may not be SIBO. Okay, just because somebody says they have has SIBO doesn't necessarily mean they have it. You've got to test to confirm it. So when it comes to SIBO intervention, yeah, it's important to do small intestinal bacterial reduction, but we need to also look at digestion look at liver and gallbladder function and do supportive therapy for that. What's the health of the large intestine as well as addressing motility? All of these factors are critical. So let's take a quick look at the digestive system as a functional unit. It's actually a functional unit of coordinated physiology beginning in the mouth. Our digestion starts in the mouth. So we basically are going from north to south. A lot of times, a lot of, uh, you know, focus is just paid attention to what's happening here in the small intestine, but it all begins up here. So let's go through a few things here. We have enzymes in our saliva. Okay, amylase, for example, is necessary to break down maltose into glucose. So we, we actually begin the process of carbohydrate digestion in the mouth. And there is amylase, not only in the mouth, but also coming from the pancreas. So in both areas, our body kind of figures, hey, we, we really need to break down these, these carbohydrates if, you know, in order to avoid problems. So mouth to small intestine, mouth to pancreas is key. There's also many other enzymes that get released in the small intestine too that have an effect on protein and fat digestion. So when it comes to the first phase of supporting somebody with SIBO, we have to look at stomach digestion, pancreatic enzyme release, small intestine digestion, and even mouth you know, digestion as well, getting people to actually chew their food more appropriately as opposed to just taking a couple bites and swallowing. The stomach is a huge area with regards to digestion, obviously. I mean, it's the area where we're really beginning the process of protein digestion. It's very acidic. It's also an area that is helping to neutralize pathogens that are entering our digestive system. There's little cells that exist within the stomach. Our parietal cells are what produces hydrochloric acid, and chief cells are what produce pepsinogen. The hydrochloric acid that's produced that lowers the pH has an activating effect on pepsinogen that gets produced by cells called chief cells. And the chief cells that produce pepsinogen in the presence of adequate hydrochloric acid converts the pepsinogen to pepsin. Pepsin is the active enzyme that is necessary to begin the breakdown of protein in the stomach. If something damages the parietal cells, we're not going to be able to produce hydrochloric acid. If something damages the chief cells, we're not going to be able to produce pepsinogen. And then obviously a lack of hydrochloric acid in the stomach, we're not going to get good activation of pepsinogen to pepsin conversion. And then as I mentioned before, the last part of this equation from a digestive standpoint is what's happening with regards to the liver and gallbladder. The liver produces bile salts. And these bile salts, what are also called bile acids, are incredibly important for our overall digestion and function of our small intestine. The bile helps to neutralize the acidic contents that are entering the small intestine from the stomach. Also, stomach acid and bile stimulate the release of pancreatic enzymes. So if we don't have good bile secretions from the liver, we may not get good pancreatic enzyme production, which then compromises our ability to digest fats, proteins, and carbohydrates that are hitting our small intestine. 
And the other important thing is that bile being produced from the liver is what stimulates the migrating motor complex, this myoelectric wave formation that helps to move and propel things through the small intestine. Turns out bile also has an effect on stimulation of the large intestine too. So as functional medicine practitioners, we're not interested in just throwing an antibiotic at somebody, you know, or throwing a, a antimicrobial botanical at somebody just to kill off their small intestinal bacteria in order to really make a difference in SIBO. We've got to support all phases of digestion. And understanding how things normally should function allows us then how to make intervention to try to bring normal function back in areas that are compromised. <clears throat> but also we need to understand that SIBO is not or isn't something that just occurs on its own. Something causes it, something triggers it, or multiple things are at play. It could be an infection, in addition to somebody on long-term proton pump inhibitors. It could be somebody who had surgery, but then also had an infection on top of it. So it, it takes a little time to figure these things out. And other kinds of laboratory testing are necessary to try to identify some of these triggering events. And no matter what kind of chronic health situation we're dealing with, I firmly believe that dietary intervention is appropriate for almost everybody. And it clearly is that case in that way for SIBO. Lifestyle changes, you know, can be important too. And once we do all this, yeah, then we're going to get good effect from reducing bacterial load. I mentioned before, you can take a comprehensive botanical remedy from many of the different companies that produce them, give it to somebody with SIBO and they'll probably feel better for a period of time. But if that's all you do and they stop that remedy, their SIBO likely is going to come back. Same thing with an antibiotic. So we don't want to treat SIBO allopathically. Allopathically is they just throw an antibiotic and maybe use a motility agent. Okay, we want to take a more comprehensive approach to really make inroads into this disorder. And one of the things I like to use this quote from my partner, Dr. Trancatella, you know, she often comments and, and works with people with, with SIBO issues and other chronic bowel problems. And she's a big advocate for testing. Because as she stated, the digestive system has only so many presenting symptoms towards imbalances. Symptoms attributed to SIBO may also be symptoms of other problems. This is why it's important to test. We're not just assuming it's there, we're actually verifying that it's a problem. So hydrogen and methane breath testing is important. Okay, one of the labs that we've worked with for years in doing testing for SIBO is BioHealth Lab. And the one profile that we use commonly to start is the 900C profile. One of the other things that we look at is protein digestion bile acid production, and even lipid peroxides. But when it comes to SIBO, we really you know, want to take a look at, are we pro digesting protein very well? Are we actually producing bile acids adequately? Indikin is a byproduct of protein maldigestion. And it comes about primarily because of the inability to break down tryptophan, an amino acid often found in meat, or not often, it is found in meat. And there could be a lot of reasons that this can occur. Low stomach acid. Now that could occur because somebody's on acid blocking medication like a proton pump inhibitor. That could occur because there's inflammation, long-standing inflammation in the stomach that's damaged the cells that make hydrochloric acid. Perhaps the pancreas is not producing enzymes effectively. Intestinal parasites, yeast, even clostridia bacterial infections may be associated with it. Poor bile acid production from the liver. And 
SIBO, okay, bacterial overgrowth of the small intestine is another known cause of high endocrine link to protein maldigestion. Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria that can invade the stomach. It can be a trigger for ulcers in some individuals. It has a number of different toxins it can produce that can have a wide range of effects in damaging host tissues. It's also one of the things that could damage the stomach's ability to make hydrochloric acid. Now, in some people, they actually have an overproduction of hydrochloric acid in the presence of H. pylori, but usually long-standing H. pylori infections in, in a lot of people the, the uh, hydrochloric acid production of producing mechanisms are often compromised. So H. pylori can be a reason for high endocrine, for poor protein digestion, for reflux. And then when you have poor stomach digestion, you're now setting up the, the, the mechanisms at play here to actually then cause problems in the small intestine. So helicobacter pylori is something that should be ruled out in people with SIBO, as well as parasites, okay? Giardia, cryptosporidium, for example. And so there's a number of labs that provide stool testing. Well, Health Laboratory does. A lot of people do the GI MAP test, which you know it can be an, an identifying test for certain pathogens, as well as H. pylori. In fact, the GI MAP does look at different factors with regards to pathogenicity mechanisms of H. pylori, and then the comprehensive digestive stool tests okay, that uh, Great Plains provides <clears throat> that look at a wide variety of different parasitic infections uh, and common ones too, like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. So stool testing becomes a very important part of assessing people who have SIBO or suspected of having SIBO. Another angle to this is that many people with irritable bowel as, as well as SIBO can have mental emotional issues, sometimes mild, sometimes severe. There's quite a bit of research that shows that these types of individuals are often affected by anxiety and depression. And some of the effects can come about because of toxins produced within the digestive system that can either find their way directly into the brain through the vagus nerve, or perhaps get to the brain by being produced, dumped you know, into general circulation within the body and perhaps cross the blood-brain barrier. Which brings us to the organic acids test. The organic acids test, to me, is one of the most important tests to do for anybody who's dealing with a chronic illness. To me, it's the hub of the wheel. It's, the, it's really an important place to start. It's an area that I have personally seen deficient as far as practitioners um, understanding of the organic acid test or the importance of it when it comes to SIBO. So a lot of times people will just, practitioners will jump right into just SIBO testing and not kind of analyze other things. Or they may do a stool test, but they forget about the oat. And I think that's a big problem. And so what we do as practitioners in our practice is we're always doing the organic acid test in addition to other testing. And this is one of the things too that I teach about as well. And here's why. The organic acid test has a lot of markers. But if you just look at what's happening on page one of the OAT test from Great Plains, we've got markers here that can indicate dysbiosis. Okay, so they clearly indicate some kind of bacterial imbalance that's happening in the, in the digestive system. Now, we don't know if it's coming from the small intestine or the, small, the large intestine. Okay, the, that's where the hydrogen and methane breath testing would come into play. But clearly we know there's a problem Okay, so in this particular case, this person's got quite, you know, elevated levels here. And then other times we'll actually see a couple of markers on the organic acid test, hyperic and DHPPA, which is linked to activity of normal bacteria, but the levels are high. 
Okay, again, that doesn't necessarily define SIBO, but that is something that may be seen in SIBO where we're getting an accumulation of normal colonic bacteria now in the small intestine. But there's another reason that we do the organic acid test, and that has to do with clostridia. At the bottom of page one of the organic acid test is the clostridia bacterial markers. Now, some of them are linked to the presence of clostridia difficile, a known bacteria to cause digestive inflammation and, dis and dysfunction. There are other species of clostridia that produce these compounds, these particular toxins here, that could be affecting the gut, but many of these chemicals that you're seeing here, HPHBA, 4 creosol 4 hydroxyphenylacetic can also have an adverse effect on the body systemically. It's known that Clostridia bacteria in general is a very hardy, sophisticated organism. What it does when it gets into the digestive system and once it hits the colon primarily, it starts proliferating. It goes through what's called a vegetative phase. And it's in this phase where it's producing a wide variety of these different toxins that have a damaging effect on the colonic mucosa. But if you're getting some overgrowth situation occurring in the first part of the small intestine, this may have a, a, a compromised effect on the ileocecal valve as well. The other thing with regards to the presence of these clostridia bacteria is how they affect the brain and nervous system and why they can have a triggering effect on things like depression and anxiety, for example. The organic acid test evaluates for different clostridia bacteria. Okay, it looks at, or toxins, I should say. It looks at HPHBA or 4 creosol, for example, and these are known to have an inhibiting effect on dopamine beta hydroxylase. And when that dopamine beta hydroxylase is inhibited, we start to see an increase of dopamine that is then measurable by an increase in homovanillic acid. Now, too much dopamine in the brain or nervous system can be toxic because the byproduct of dopamine actually is a, causes oxidative stress in the nerve cells, can deplete glutathione and even damage mitochondria. If we're getting a blockage of dopamine beta hydroxylase, we can, can start to have a decrease in norepinephrine and epinephrine. And that's seen many times with a decrease of VMA on the organic acid test. And this will compromise energy production of the body, cause or contribute to fatigue, for example. So assessing for the presence of these other bacteria are critically important because of the systemic effects that they can have. And the other thing is, is that Clostridia is also a very uh, recurrent bacteria. It's difficult to get rid of. The other aspect of doing the, or one of the reasons to do the organic acid test with people with this condition is the presence of these yeast and fungal markers. I mean, candida itself, I think is often associated with irritable bowel or SIBO. It's a contributing factor, can often in, increase problems of bloating and gas and discomfort, but it can also lead to systemic issues too. So it can lead to some of the brain fog and physical pain that people sometimes feel. Another thing that we've started doing in our practice is we're starting to run a lot of the mold testing. The organic acid test on page one has markers that identify the presence of certain mold. Two, four, and five, okay, are linked to the presence of aspergillus mold. Now, you don't know if that aspergillus mold is coming from the gut 
or if it is in the sinuses or in the lungs. Usually people who have environmental exposure to mold and it's it's in their lungs or sinuses usually have some kind of symptoms. They've got respiratory, upper respiratory issues, sinus congestion, et cetera. But you can also get mold that grows in the gut. Now, mold exposure can occur through food. Aspergillus mold is very common in corn and corn products, for example. It can also occur from environmental exposures. And there's many indoor molds that we're exposed to, penis, oh, excuse me, aspergillus being top of the list. So the mycotox profile that Great Plains has is a critical test to do, and I feel should be done on every single person who either suspects they have SIBO or has been diagnosed with SIBO. And here's some reasons why. These mycotoxins are extremely immunotoxic. They actually can suppress the immune system. They can lead to a suppression of secretory IgA and the, the mucosal lining of our digestive system is our largest immune organ. So diminishments in secretory IgA increase the potential for opportunistic infections. These mycotoxins can lead to oxidative stress and they can also damage mitochondria. And so the mycotox test from Great Plains has a number of different mycotoxins it evaluates. Let's just talk real briefly about three, ochratoxin, mycophenolic, and gliotoxin. I mentioned before that aspergillus you can see the presence of it on the organic acid test at times. Markers two, four, and five are actually linked to the presence of aspergillus mold. Now, that doesn't mean somebody who does not have an elevation of two, four, or five on the oat couldn't have aspergillus exposure. It's still possible they could, but when, it's, when, they're, when these markers are elevated, clearly it's a problem and most likely colonizing the gut. But aspergillus produces the okra, uh, excuse me, the mycotoxin, ochratoxin. And as I, you know, I mentioned before, ochratoxin uh, is one of the, actually one of the most common mycotoxins that many of us have. It's carcinogenic, it's also immunotoxic. And because because it's immune toxin can lead to deficiencies in immune function that could compromise gut health and even gut immunity. The other mycotoxin that is important in this discussion is mycophenolic. This is produced by penicillium mold that actually inhibits T and B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are what produce antibodies. One of the antibodies that we need to help healthy digestive system is secretory IgA. And what's being shown is that people who tend to have higher levels of mycophenolic are also individuals who tend to have the presence or higher levels of Clostridia bacteria as well as Candida. So the risk of, of these types of infections goes up. And so these are our two, you know, Clostridia and Candida are two things that can sometimes occur along with SIBO and make the situation worse. Gliotoxin. Now, gliotoxin is actually produced by aspergillus mold. And one of the things that gliotoxin can do itself is immune suppressive. So it, it affects the immune system in various ways that actually cause immune suppression, but it also can target mitochondria. So it can actually lead to mitochondrial damage. And there's a big movement now in the SIBO world of trying to test people or treat, test people for mitochondrial problems or, or treat the mitochondrial issues if they're occurring. And one of the things that we've seen that tends to be a major driver of mitochondrial dysfunction in people is bacterial toxicity 
coming from the digestive system. Excuse me a sec. <clears throat> Sorry about that. My throat's getting dry. <clears throat> um, is bacterial toxins coming from the digestive system as well as candida and yeast toxins and mold toxins. So if there is any suspicion of mitochondrial dysfunction, so if you're an individual who is either currently being treated for SIBO or suspects you have it, and you have not done the organic acid test at this point, you need to do it. Because what we're finding is a lot of people have mitochondrial problems occurring because of these chronic pathogens. And the organic acid test will help to define that. And then it comes back to the fact that, you know, not all of these mycotoxins are, are studied or even known in some of the effects that they can have, but there is a relationship between mycotoxins, this particular mycotoxin, this was actually from a paper many years ago that showed that this particular mycotoxin actually altered migrating motor complex activity. So if you affect at migrating motor complex activity, you are going to increase the potential for the development of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. <clears throat> so when it comes to SIBO testing, there's a number of things that we feel should be done. Yeah, you definitely want to do SIBO testing, okay? So looking at hydrogen and methane testing is important, but you shouldn't stop there. It's important to check for protein digestion and bile acid formation. It's important to test for uh, other types of pathogens, parasitic infections, helicobacter pylori infections. I think the organic acid test is a critical test to have done. The incorporation of the mycotox profile, I think is very important now, particularly as we've been able to correlate how much of a problem these mycotoxins can have in spurring on issues related to chronic yeast, as well as Clostridia bacteria. I didn't mention here anything about food IgG testing, but this is also a worthwhile thing to look at. Great Plains has this test to just get an idea, is there some kind of elevated food reaction, whether it's dairy, gluten, or something else, even if you're doing a SIBO-related diet, periodically checking to make sure you're not reactive to something else that might be problematic. So one of the things that we have through Integrated Medicine Academy is a entire course dedicated to SIBO, but it's more than just a SIBO course. As we know, SIBO can be related to irritable bowel syndrome. And so the information will cross over between irritable bowel and SIBO. But in addition to that, we don't stop at SIBO because we also understand that somebody's chronic digestive problems may not be SIBO related. It could be coming from Helicobacter pylori, parasitic infections, liver gallbladder problems could be coming from clostridia, where those could all be contributing factors as well as mold um, and mycotoxin exposure. So this SIBO mastery course, which we have coming up in a couple of weeks on May 23rd, is a very comprehensive course to go through the fundamentals of SIBO testing and then analyzing SIBO and SIBO diets and treatments for SIBO, but also to expand out to other types of chronic digestive problems that could either be linked to SIBO or present like SIBO, but are different. So if you want more information about this course, you can go to SIBOMasteryCourse.com. One of the things that we get into in this course in depth too is how to interpret the organic acids test and new information that we're adding is on the mycotoxin testing as well. So there's our outline. So it's a nine module course um, each module 
lectures about an hour and a half and we also have you know a bonus lectures that many times uh, come with these uh, uh, modules as well for additional information you have access to this book so you can text SIBO to 66866 and you'll get a link to this particular book If you've not attended one of Great Plains Laboratories workshops through the GPL Academy on the organic acid test, I'd highly recommend you do so. Um, I do the first day typically at these, at these seminars. I do a whole entire day on the incorporation of the organic acid test into practice. And then usually day two or sometimes day three of the seminars, depending on whether it's a two or three day, there's you know, more discussion on chemical testing and heavy metal testing and other tests that Great Plains provides. So you can get more information on the GPL Academy at greatplainslaboratory.com. We have other courses through Integrative Medicine Academy. In fact, one of the first courses that I've put together and currently involved in now is the Autism Mastery course. We've got toxicity. We also have courses on, on hormones and adrenal issues as well. And then a newer course that we just launched um, is Functional Medicine Mastery Course. So if you're a practitioner that is just kind of getting involved in functional medicine, wanting to learn how to incorporate this into practice, trying to get an understanding about what all these tests and supplements and all this stuff means, this is a course that could be you know, well-suited for you. So functionalmedicinemasterycourse.com, you can go to the website and check out the material for this particular course. And the idea here with all of our courses through Integrated Medicine Academy is try to unravel the root cause, is to dig down deep and try and figure out what are some of the underlying problems that are leading to many of these different types of health conditions that patients have. There's a website called Lab Test Plus. Lab Test Plus, um, offers many of these labs from Great Plains, from BioHealth and others. So SIBO testing, organic acid testing, stool testing is all available. Uh, and any lab that's ordered through Lab Test Plus will come with a written review of the relevant markers and what are called action step suggestions as well. So if you wanna get an idea of what labs are available from Lab Test Plus, you can go to labtestplus.com or you can email to labtestplus at gmail.com. And then I'm always available, as well as my partner, Dr. Trecatella, for private consultations. Um, you can reach us at 951-461-4800, or email, uh, let me go back, email at scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for your attention. If you happen to post questions, Great Plains will usually send those to me um, sometime over the next few days once they get everything together, and I'll answer questions through the email. Um, so you can reach out to me, you know, in, in other um, you know, avenues that we have through email from the office, et cetera, for ongoing questions. So this is Dr. Kurt Wohler for the Great Plains Laboratory Monthly Seminars. I hope you enjoyed this information. I look forward to presenting things again coming up here. I think actually next month, Dr. Trecatella is giving a presentation from my practice. So I will see you again soon. Take care.